Good evening, everyone. My name is Clarissa. I am the creator of She Rocks at College and Study School. And tonight I am hosting a Study Skills Q&A where you can come in and have all of your college questions answered regarding how to succeed in your classes, regarding how to plan for college, how to decrease overall, anything that you you struggle with normally throughout the semester. And so I see that a few of you are on. If you will do me the kind favor to let me know whether or not you can hear me. And if you can, just say, yes, your sound is great. If you can't hear me, let me know. And then as I do, as you guys are letting me know, I'm going to go ahead and share this video. Amy says she can hear me. Great. So I'm going to share this video in a couple of places. So just bear with me one second. Mickey says she hears me as well. Great. Um, one more place. Perfect. Okay. So, Amy says, so happy to see your face instead of all the sad pictures of everyone going on here in my neighborhood. With, I know um, you were on my mind um, this entire time, Amy, but you said that uh, in your video last night that you were high and dry, which makes me really happy to hear. Um, yeah, what's going on in Texas is, uh, it's really, um, it's overwhelming. I don't really know what else to say besides the fact that it is overwhelming. Um, so we're going to get started with this Q&A, guys. So I'm going to start off by honoring all of the students who did their homework and asked questions beforehand. So I'm going to hop over into the um, image that I posted where I asked everyone who had questions to um, put them below, if I can find it because this is my problem every time when I'm looking for something, I can never find it. Okay, so Mickey says, will I be able to view this video later? I'm at work, so I may miss some parts. Yes, Mickey, so if you are on my email list, I will be definitely for sure sending this out um, later so that everyone can watch the recording. Amy, you had a bunch of questions. Can you do me the biggest favor and go on over to the um, group and can you tag me where you ask the questions because then it'll make it easier for me to find it and then I'll be able to answer your questions. Okay, perfect. So we have Angela who asked via email, what method of studying do you find is the most helpful to help you absorb and understand information when you're studying? So before I answer this question, I want all of you to tell me in the comments what you normally do to study. What's your normal studying process? Do you create flashcards? Do you reread the textbook? Do you reread your notes? What's your normal process for studying, preparing, making sure that you show up 100% ready to kill your exam? What do you normally do? So any of you who are watching this live stream and you're not watching it directly on my Facebook page, I want to warn you that I cannot see your comments. So if you're commenting and you're not directly on my Facebook page, I cannot see your comments. So Nikki says, I read the material and write down the main points. I read the material and then I write down the main points. Amy says, reread my notes or rewrite my notes, which I found out was not the right thing to do. Okay, so um, Sherry says, read book, which takes forever. So everything that you guys are mentioning isn't actually studying. Everything that you're mentioning, reading the textbook, rewriting your notes, rereading your notes, creating flashcards, none of that is actually studying. I know. Shocker. That's actually not studying. That is all a part of the learning process. 
Everything that you just mentioned is a part of the learning process. It's not actually studying. And so when a student like Angela asked me what is the best way to study, I like to ask the question, well, what are you currently doing? Because a normal student, so someone like you, thinks that reading the textbook, writing their notes, doing all that jazz, right? Going to lecture is part of studying. It's actually not. It's part of the learning process. And so what studying is, and my definition of studying, and the whole purpose of studying, is to figure out what you still don't know. So the whole point of studying is actually to prove to yourself that maybe you don't know this information, that maybe you should be looking up a YouTube video, or maybe you should go back to that section in the book and make sure that you understand it. The studying process is a process for you to figure out what's going to cause me to make a mistake on the exam. What can I not prove to myself that I know? Where is there a knowledge gap? That's really what studying is. And so the best way to study is in a way where you're quote unquote quizzing yourself or testing yourself on the material in the same way that you would probably see it on the exam. Now, I don't mean that you have to write multiple choice questions or do multiple choice questions. What I'm saying is that you have to test to see if you actually know the information. Because when you're rereading your notes or writing your notes over and over, it causes a false knowing. So our brain thinks that we actually know the information simply because it looks familiar to us. So when we read the notes, we're like, oh, I remember reading that. Oh yeah, I know that. But then if someone, say a little bit later, when you don't have your notes in front of you, asks you to explain to them a concept and you can't explain it, that means that you actually don't know it. If you need to be triggered with a word or triggered with um, uh, something in front of you in order to be able to recall that information, you don't actually know it. So the best way to study is in a way where you're testing yourself to see, do I know this information enough that no matter what question is thrown at me, I can figure out what the answer should be. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions around that before I move on? Any questions around that before I move on? Yes, no. This is interactive, guys. Okay, Amy says she understands. So if Amy understands, I'm moving on. <laughs> um, so the next question comes from Shelly. And Shelly says, um, thank you so much for last week and the last few days. So for those of you who don't know, I have been hosting a challenge. This, I hosted a challenge this past weekend called the Create Your Study Routine in a Weekend. And Shelly has been one of the girls who's been participating, so she's really enjoyed the content in that. So she is asking, even after breaking everything down, how do you stay focused and not become overwhelmed about university? So here's what I know about overwhelm. Here's what I know about stress. If you are feeling overwhelmed, if you are feeling stressed, the reason why is because you're living in the future. You're living in a world where what you want to get done is already done. And the concept of you getting it done baffles you. It stresses you out because you don't know how to approach it. But you're thinking in your mind, I have to get this done. You're living in the future where it is done, but you don't know how to get from where you are right now to where it is that you want to be. So overwhelm really comes from a place of not knowing how to approach whatever it is 
that's in front of you. So what you need to do is to sit down and break it down. To sit down and actually write out everything that's on your plate. To brainstorm what's the very first thing that has to happen before anything else can happen. So in the case of a paper, before you can begin writing a paper, what's the first thing that you have to do? Because if you're thinking about the end product, which is a 15-page paper in APA format on quantum physics, that's going to overwhelm you because what you're doing is you're living in the future. You're living in a place where that outcome is already done and you don't know how to go about it. So the idea of having to write a 15 page paper on quantum physics, it's like, how do you, how do you even begin? That's really what the, what the question is, is how do you even begin? And so the reason why you can't bring yourself to a place where you're not as stressed is because you haven't been able to reverse engineer the process. So how do you begin to reverse engineer the process? It's simple. It starts by asking yourself the question, what is the very first thing that I have to do if I want to get started on this? And in the case of a paper on quantum physics, the very first thing is to read the directions. What's required in regards to this paper? What specifically on quantum physics do I need to write? How long does it need to be? How many resources do I need? So that helps begin the process. Once you know what the requirement is, then you can begin to think about what the next step after that is. Well, the next step after that is simple. It's just brainstorming topics. You can brainstorm topics. You've brainstormed topics in the past. That small task is doable. Writing a 15-page paper on quantum physics seems impossible. But when you break it down into look at the directions, you've looked at directions before, right? You've looked at directions on how to get somewhere, directions on how to build something, directions on how to, how to um, sign up for your classes. You can do that. So that becomes something easy that you can do. Then it's easy to brainstorm topics, right? So then the next step after that is to look for research. You've done that before. Breaking it down into small chunks makes it manageable. It gets rid of the overwhelm because the only reason why you feel overwhelmed is because you are living in the future. You're living in a world where that thing that you want to get done is already done. And because you haven't yet sat down to think about what needs to get done, what has to happen before that paper is done, you feel overwhelmed. So the answer to that is to sit down and break it down. The same thing goes for if you feel like you have a billion things to do. Take 10 minutes at the beginning of your day and write out not a to-do list. You're not writing a to-do list. You're writing everything that's in your brain that's taking up space. So anything that comes up, I have to read this chapter. I have to drop off the laundry. I have to go buy um, the rotisserie chicken. I have to um, make sure that I call my mom back. Write everything down. Perform a brain dump. Get it out of your mind. Once it's out of your mind, you can now logically look at the list that you have and make decisions on whether or not that actually has to be done that day or that week. And if it doesn't, cross it off and it's done. Anyone have any questions about that? Does that make sense? Or do you feel like that was too woo woo and you guys didn't like my answer? Which if that's the case, I don't know what to tell you. That's the answer I have because <laughs> that's how I deal with overwhelm. The, the moment that I feel overwhelmed, I know it's because I'm, I'm living in a world where all of this stuff is done, but I'm right now I'm sitting in a place where it's not done. So the idea of how am I going to be able to get all this stuff done is what's causing me overwhelm. So if I'm confused and overwhelmed about the how, 
then I can just sit down and actually logically think through, okay, how would I approach this? What is the smallest thing that I can do at this moment? So Nikki says, makes sense. Sherry says, makes sense. Um, Amy says, exactly right. We need to quit looking at the big picture and take it day by day, action by action. Perfect. Okay, so um, I have a question here from Tiffany. And Tiffany says, um, hey, Clarissa, I've started out this fall semester a little rocky. I have a schedule in place, but it's hard to stick to. Could you take a look at my schedule and give me tips on how to have a better schedule that won't make me feel so burnt out? Okay, so Tiffany isn't on this live stream. She actually sent me the question via an email because she wasn't going to be able to be live. So I can't look at her schedule because I don't actually have it in front of me. But let's break this question down step by step. So the first thing she wants to know is, well, the first thing she says is that she has a schedule, but she can't stick to it. And this question came up yesterday inside of a Facebook group, um, and I addressed it. So, okay. Everybody wants to know why they procrastinate, or everybody wants to know how they can stop procrastinating. Everybody wants to know how they can force themselves to study, and how they can force themselves to do things that they don't want to do. Here is something that I want you to have in your mind. If today you say to yourself, tomorrow I'm going to read chapter four, five, and six, I want you to know right now that tomorrow you're not going to feel like doing it. That's just a given. It's a given. Because today you're motivated and inspired to do it, but I guarantee you 99% of the time, when tomorrow rolls around at three o'clock, when you were supposed to start reading chapter four, five, and six, the dishes are gonna look way more appealing. And you're not going to feel like reading chapter four, five, and six. And there's nothing wrong with you, it's just part of human nature. So we are actually driven more than you know by our subconscious mind. And our subconscious mind lives in a very primitive state. All it cares about is life or death. All it cares about is feeling good and avoiding feeling pain. That's it. You're driven more by your subconscious mind than you know. I just want you to be aware of that. And your subconscious mind is very primitive. It just cares about survival. How do I stay alive another day? Now, thankfully, thankfully, on a day-to-day -day basis, most of us aren't actually in physical harm. But our mind has not caught up with that fact yet. Our mind hasn't caught up with the world we live in. And it doesn't care whether or not you are actually under physical danger. All it perceives is that you're under danger because of a feeling. So our circumstances cause us to think thoughts. And our mind can't decipher between what is real and what is not real when it comes to what we say in our own minds. So if, so say for example, here's what's on your to-do list today. Your to-do list today is I need to read um, my statistic notes. What's the first thought that pops in your head? I don't want to. This is going to be boring. This is going to be hard. This is going to take forever. I would so much rather watch Netflix and catch up on Game of Thrones. I don't want to do this. I couldn't understand what the professor was saying in, in class anyway. If I try to reread the notes, I'm not going to understand it. It's too hard. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And so your mind is like, we're under attack. We're going to die. You can't put us through this. No, what are you doing? No, you can't read those notes. We'll die if you read those notes. We will die if you sit down and put yourself through that torture of reading the notes. No, we got to figure out something to do. We got to figure out something to do. And your mind and your subconscious will go out of its way 
to make it so that you don't read those notes so that it can protect itself and it'll force you to seek out something that's more pleasurable even though that thing might not be pleasurable to you on a daily basis so then cleaning cleaning your room becomes more pleasurable than reading the notes so then all of a sudden you're like miss cleaning queen and you're like vacuuming things you've never vacuumed before all of a sudden you're like yeah I'll wash the dishes sure I'll cook dinner anything that is more pleasurable than reading your notes in that moment and it's not your fault it's the way that our brain right now is currently wired it is very primitive and right now because of the fact that we're not under physical harm the harm that we cause ourselves is emotional and thoughts so circumstances so whatever it is, whatever situation you're in causes you to think thoughts think certain things whatever the thoughts are i don't want to do this this is hard i don't understand statistics i'm not a math person those thoughts create feelings and the feelings could be boredom it could be um anxiety it can be fear it can be fear of failure that kind of stuff um so it causes an emotion the emotion then causes us to act and most of the time if the emotion that we're feeling is painful the action that we take is actually in action so we don't do the thing that we're supposed to do we hide we run we fight, we get defensive, whatever, right? But the thing is, is that our actions compounded over time is what gives us the results in our lives. So if you constantly procrastinate, if you constantly choose the notes over the, uh, sorry, choose the uh, dishes over the notes, what you're producing is a state where now you're cramming now you're not in an ideal environment to learn because you're rushing now you're not in an ideal environment where you can absorb the information because you're full of anxiety now you've put yourself in a situation where you can't show up as your best self on the exam day because you lack sleep your nervous is all hell because you know you didn't study enough to prepare and for sure you're gonna fail so what do we do to start combating this what do we do to prevent our brain from basically sabotaging us the first thing is just being aware of it being aware of it so the next time that you have on your schedule that you are supposed to do X thing in regards to school and you find yourself inclined to not do it, I want you to just take a moment and notice what thought is going through your mind. What thought is going through your mind? Once you become aware of the thought, you become aware of the feeling. And once you become aware of the feeling, you know what your next action is going to be. And it's gonna be avoidance in the cases of school stuff most of the time. So you catch yourself in the act of self-sabotaging before you actually follow through with it and it's in that moment where you can make the decision to not procrastinate because you know if I enact right if I choose to procrastinate this is what the result will be I'm gonna spend all night on Friday trying to get through seven chapters, I'm gonna be so stressed, I'm gonna end up in a ball crying on the bed and my boyfriend's gonna stare at me like I'm crazy. I'm gonna feel super overwhelmed, I'm gonna walk into the exam with my hair 
all over the place, bags down to here. I'm going to walk out of there crying, knowing for sure that I failed it, because when I was looking at all the pages, it looked like a foreign language. I've never even seen it before. I wasn't even sure I was in the right class. So that is the reason why you can't stick to a schedule. It's because your subconscious mind has taken over. And it is your job to now be aware of it. And the thing is, is once you've woken up to this fact, it is super hard to forget it. Now that I've told you this, now that you know how your brain sabotages you, you're not going to you're not going to be able to go back from this. This is going to pop in your mind every single time you're about to procrastinate, which is a good thing. So I just want you to become aware of the thought and the feeling associated to the thought and know that that feeling is probably going to cause you to procrastinate in some way somehow and procrastinating doesn't always show up in the form of binge watching Netflix sometimes it shows up in the form of doing work for another class that's easier because the class that you should be studying right now is hard and your brain perceives that as pain and as you're killing me. So let's go focus over here where this is easy and I won't die. But you have to remind yourself it's all in your mind and remind yourself of the result that the action you're taking is going to produce. Okay, does that make sense? That was a little bit long winded, but does that make sense? So Mickey says that was me last night when I had to read statistic notes. I cleaned the kitchen instead. <laughs> um, Amy says, yep, I don't want to exactly. Mickey says exactly my thoughts, LOL. Um, Erica says, that's me. I know everything I need to do and then do none of them. Uh, and then Sherry says, you're so right. And then everyone's saying, yes, 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 because you guys understand. Perfect. Okay. So that was part one of um, Tiffany's question. So um, part two was, how do I make a better schedule that won't make me feel so burnt out? Now, if you are feeling burnt out with your schedule, automatically I know that your focus has not been on self-care. Automatically I know that your schedule probably has zero white space. Automatically I know that you've been too hyper-focused on one or two areas of your life. One of the first things that I tell my students to do when they create their schedule is pick a day or two half days where you'll do nothing. Those two days are days for you to relax, rejuvenate, spend time with your husband or boyfriend or friends or mom or dad or kids. All of us need that rest period so that we can show up as our best selves. But if you do not control your time, if you do not decide how your time is spent, you better believe that your time is going to disappear into other people's plans for your time. It's just like money. If you don't tell your money where to go, you better believe that every other store you see, every fast food restaurant has a marketing plan to take your money. It's the same thing with time. You have control over your time. We all get 168 hours a week. I guarantee you that you are not spending 168 hours a week studying. I guarantee you that you're not spending 168 hours a week at your job. I guarantee you that you're not spending 168 hours a week bathing your kids. 
I guarantee you that you're not spending 168 hours a week cooking dinner. I guarantee you that you're not spending 168 hours a week in class. So where is your time going? Have you sat down and actually tracked it? Because I bet an hour is being wasted on Instagram. Two hours is being wasted on trying to decide what you want to do because you were too lazy to create a plan for yourself. Three hours is being spent talking to someone that you don't even really care about. I mean, that sounds harsh, but it's, let's just be real. Um, scrolling through Facebook, checking up on someone who you don't even know. Watching all these videos that's just putting negativity into your brain. You have control over your time. You make the decision. There are certain things that are set in stone, like your work schedule, your class schedule. But all the other time around that, you decide when you're doing what. So take time, block off time to relax and rejuvenate so that you don't end up at a point where you're burnt out. And Amy says, we all probably waste so much time on social media. Yeah, you're doing it right now, right? You're watching me talk. Although I'm giving you value, I'm giving you tips or anything, but you know, if you have other priorities, other things that you should be doing, this would be considered a waste of time, right? Um, just want to, like, I just want to be real, <laughs> right? So um, the other thing is, if you're someone who's thinking right now, no, but I, I, I really don't have the time. Like, I've created this schedule. Like, it takes me 12 hours just to read one chapter. It took me three days the other week just to write a page of notes. I mean, I had to rewrite it over and over, and I had to take out, you know, every color of my lapel pens, and I had to make it beautiful. And, and you didn't even know how long it took me to get through, get through the questions for my math exam. It was like seven hours. I just, I really don't have the time to just relax. Well, in that case, you need to develop some skills in the arena of studying, in the arena of reading, in the arena of note taking that cuts down on your time because what you lack in skill, you will make up in time, meaning that if you don't, if you're not a master in something, it takes you twice as long to complete it as compared to someone who is a master in it. What you lack in skill, you will make up in time. If you don't, if you don't know the mission, mission study, 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 study. if you don't know the most effective ways to read, if you don't know the most effective ways to write your notes, it's going to take you double the amount of time it'll take a student who has those skills. You know those people in your class. They'll show up and they'll be like, I studied for like two hours and I got 120 points on that exam. And the exam only went to like 100, right? They're like, they're the ones that are like, I barely even studied. I didn't think it was that hard. And you want to just smack them across the face because you're like, I just spent seven days studying for this exam and I got a 72, didn't even pass, right? So what's the difference between them and you? The only difference is that they probably have the study skills that allowed them to be able to barely study for the exam. Now, I'm going to um, <laughs> let you know that I do have something called study school that teaches college students the study skills that not only lands them on the dean's list, but also gives you that free time where you can engage in activities that will help boost up your resume, that'll help you get to know your professors so that they can write letters of recommendation for you for grad school and for getting jobs. So if you are interested in that, um, I'm gonna put the link in the comments. Um, this is like a shameless plug. I'm not embarrassed to like put this in here because it's helpful. And the only reason why it's not free is because 
In my experience, when I've worked with students for free, they don't take things seriously. They don't show up for calls. They don't do the homework. They don't see the value in it. And frankly, my time is way too valuable for me to be wasting it. And so I only work with students who are serious and committed um, to improving their study skills, who value their worth, um, value their education so much that they're willing to do whatever it takes and they're committed. So just want to put that out there for anyone who might be struggling and has no idea what to do and they've reached the end of the line where they're going to get kicked out of a program or lose a scholarship or have to drop out of college because they just cannot uh, keep up with the workload. So just want to put that out there. Okay. So that was that question. So let's move on. See if we have any more. And then Amy was going to tag me in something. So let me see. Okay, there. So Amy's question is, how do you recommend getting through 20 to 30 chapters from three different textbooks on a recommending re recommended reading list and PowerPoints for an upcoming test in nursing school within the next three to four weeks before the exam. Okay, so I want you to listen to this again and tell me the word that stands out to you. And I'm gonna put emphasis on it so that you can, <laughs> so you guys don't just struggle this hard. So what would you do to get through 20 to 30 chapters from three different textbooks on a recommended reading list and PowerPoints for an upcoming test in nursing school. What word stands out to you? Bueller. Anyone? Bueller. Erica says, recommended. Correct. Recommended is not the same thing as required. And in my book, recommended is a waste of freaking time unless they say, please read it because there will be a question on the exam. And 90% of the time, they will say, yes, this article is not in your textbook, but we will ask you a question, so please read it, right? Usually they'll say that. But if it's recommended, it's not the same thing as required. And in my book, recommended is if you're like, you got so much free time in the world that you don't know what to do with it. Then you read that recommended list. But unless it's required, or unless you're going to see a question on on the exam, I don't even open that sucker. I don't even print it out. I don't even click on the link in the email or on Blackboard. It doesn't exist to me. The only thing that exists is the required textbook or the required PowerPoint or whatever it is, but recommended doesn't even exist. I don't even see it. Don't even bother with it. Um, I was not one of those students who wanted to appear really smart, so I did like all of the reading in terms of like even the recommended. No, no, no. We just do the required. Um, so Amy says, that is what they say we need to study for tests, la, la, la. That is what I dealt with during spring semester. So, oh, sorry. So can't, let me read this again because maybe I'm not understanding it. That is what they, they say we need to study for the test. LOL. That is what I dealt with during spring semester. So one of the things that we have to do um, is evaluate exams. So every single time you complete an exam, every single time you finish an exam, you need to do a post-exam review. So you need to... Um, take an inventory or do a feedback loop on um, what actually happened. Okay, so what did you do to prepare for the exam is the first thing that you have to always keep a running list of what you did to prepare for the exam because you always want to keep track of what you did, what worked, what didn't work so that you can adjust for the next exam so that you don't repeat the same mistakes. The second thing that you have to do is think back to the exam. Think about where did most of the questions come from? Did they come from the lecture and I didn't attend the lecture? Or did they come from the lecture and I spent way too much time reading the book, right? Did the questions mainly come from the book? 
did the question mainly come from articles that were recommended ratings, right? Um, did, um, yeah, so like ask yourself those questions to find out what your primary resource should be. Because if you realize that all of the questions really came from the stuff that was on the PowerPoint, then what you might want to do for the next exam is not read the textbook or not so not to not put so much emphasis on reading the textbook and you might want to uh, focus more on the powerpoints and just use the textbook as sort of a backup resource if you don't understand something that was on the powerpoint um, and that's really that's really how i tell students to approach um, their textbook so my thing is that everybody learns differently. I'm not talking about learning styles because there's been many studies that I have looked into that have proven that learning styles, um, learning, uh, learning styles actually don't exist. So the, the idea that some people learn better when they listen to things and some people learn better when they write things and some people learn better when they can see things. There's actually been many studies proving, disproving that um, theory. So but students do learn differently in the sense that they have preferences. There are some people who prefer to hear someone talking about a concept. I am not one of those people. I actually barely went to lecture in nursing school. I learn better when I can read something or watch a video and draw my own conclusions, my own connections. Um, so some people prefer to read. And so if your primary source of, unless your lecture is required, if you know that you absorb information best when you can take your time reading it, don't go to lecture. There's this book called A Mind for Numbers. And in the book, there is this testimonial from a medical student, uh, a neuro, a neuro um, physician, and he actually failed out of his first uh, year in medical school, and he realized that he just just didn't enjoy the lectures. He didn't get as much from the lectures as he did from the readings. So the next three years in med schools, he never went to the lectures. He never watched the lectures. He just relied on the textbook and then obviously because he is a neuroscientist physician whatever now he obviously passed so it's about finding your groove if you are someone who finds that you understand material better when someone else breaks it down in their own words use lecture as your main source where you get the bulk of your information and then the textbook is a backup resource where you can refer back to if you find that maybe you forgot a concept or it wasn't that clear and you need something else to kind of solidify that information. On the other hand, if you are someone who primarily uh, feels like they absorb information best, they can make the most sense out of it when they can take their time reading, then the textbook is your primary source of getting the information. But then you can go to lecture as a supplement or you can watch a video online as a supplement for things that you're having a hard time grasping when you're reading. So do you have to absolutely read the textbook? No. You don't. Do you absolutely have to go to lecture in order to be successful? No, you don't. I'm proof of that. I graduated nursing school with honors and like barely went to lecture. I relied primarily on my textbook. But that's the way that I prefer to learn. That's the way that I've witnessed that I absorb information best because I can take my time going through my reading process, um, which actually doesn't take a bunch of time. It helps me pinpoint all the key points really fast um, and then I only read the things that like I'm having a hard time grasping so that was that question does that make sense to everyone specifically to you Amy since you asked the question
Okay, so the next question, again, comes from Amy, and she asked, um, how do I make sure I don't forget to review things from week one on week four before the exam? So what I'm assuming is that every at the end of every month, most of, every two to three weeks, maybe two to four weeks, there's an exam. And so up until this point, you're getting all of the chapters, all of the lectures, all of the PowerPoints, all of the everything um, that you're going to be tested on at the end of the month. So how do you keep up with everything and how do you make sure that you don't forget things? So here's what I want to tell you. There is a studying process. And in the studying process, it's going to require you to expose yourself to information multiple times. The very first time that you're exposed to information that you're going to be tested on usually is in lecture or the textbook. The second time that you're exposed to the information is when you are writing your notes for that information. And then if you want to, if you would like, at the end of the week, what you can do is build in a mini quiz and recall on all of the information that was covered just in that week, if that's what you prefer because you're afraid that you're going to forget things. That's not how I approached things. I kind of did my reading, did my notes, <clears throat> I kept up with everything. And then I would make sure that I kept up with everything to a point where I allowed myself anywhere between five to seven days before the actual exam to do a review of everything, to actually study, and to figure out what I knew and didn't know, remembered or couldn't remember it up until that point. And then the rest of my study time was focused on the things that I realized, oh crap, I forgot this. Oh crap, it's been a long time since we covered that. But you already had the foundation in your mind. So it's not like you're relearning the whole thing all over again. You're just focusing in on the things that you might have forgotten or got or wasn't as clear because there had been a bit of a time period in between. And actually, the act of forgetting is a great learning strategy. We actually have to allow time to forget in order to build a stronger pathway with the information. And that has been neurologically proven. That when we allow time between information, the next time we see it, the next, next time we review it, it actually becomes stronger in terms of memory for us. And you can go and look up the research for this, okay? It's been proven in many research by neuroscientists that the act of forgetting aids in learning. Because the next time you expose yourself to the information, you actually solidify the neural pathway in your brain. You allow your brain to make connections in the background when you're not thinking about it. So that the next time you see it, it actually becomes clear. You start noticing things that you didn't notice before. You start making connections that solidify that information. So does that make sense? Give me hearts or likes or some feedback so that I know that I'm not talking to myself. So that I know that I should keep answering questions. Because this feels very awkward. I'm just talking to the screen and no one's talking back. I just want to make sure that you guys are, like, that I'm not frozen or something, that you guys are still here and you're still able to um, receive. Okay, someone put a heart. Thank you very much. Okay. So the next question is... How do I know what information is important and what I don't need to worry with from textbook, chapters, PowerPoints, and lectures? So this is actually going to depend class to class. Um, so the first thing, what's the first thing that you should do is go talk to your professors about it because they're the ones creating the exams. 
But when you go to them, okay, you have to show that you actually did some work. You can't just go and ask them, tell me what's important because they won't tell you or they'll give you really vague answers, right? So you have to show that you have done some work. You have to go and you have to show that you prepared and that you have an idea of what you think that's important and what you're going is for clarification, right? Um, the second thing is take a look at your course description. Take a look at your course description. There's a lot of information in there in that course description that tells you exactly what's going to be important and what's not and how they're going to ask you questions. So I'll leave it at that. The next question is, how do you recommend preparing for on-campus classroom lectures? Um, that's going to be very similar to um, what I just talked about with talking to your professors. Um, definitely pre-reading. Um, previewing the chapter is important because it gives you an idea of what they're going to talk about. And when you are aware of what they're going to talk about, your ears perk up to that information. And so you tend to pick up things that are important. Um, and then after lecture, do you recommend to go back over notes within a couple of hours after lecture or wait a day or two? Um, you can wait a whole, like you can do it at the end of the week. You can do it a couple of hours later, as long as there is a period of allowing to forget. So whether that's a few hours, whether it's a couple of days, you just need to allow enough time space in between where you can let your brain forget and make those connections subconsciously. So that process happens subconsciously so that the next time you look at the information, um, the neural pathways become stronger in regards to what you're learning. So that that was the final question that was submitted previous to me actually going live. Anyone who is on, looks like there are five people on with me right now. Anyone who is on, do you have any questions that you would like me to answer? Now is your chance or forever hold your peace. I will stay here as long as people have questions. Oh my God, I've been missing all of the, the comments, guys. That's why. Ay, ay, ay. Amy says, sounds like straight from Make It Stick. I remember reading that. Learning experts. Learning experts. Mickey says, that's the problem I have. I don't know what's important. If I'm taking notes, it's like I just rewrote the whole chapter. Mickey, take a look at the course description. I'm telling you, golden information there. Golden. Now, now everybody knows how to specifically use the course description to get this kind of information. And there are actually five different areas that professors um, sneakily tell you what is important what they're going to test you on, and how they will actually test you on it, and the kind of questions that you can expect. And that's something that I um, do cover inside of study school. So if you want to learn, you know, how to figure out what's important, what you should even be writing down, if you, if you wish that your professor would tell you, this is how you succeed in this class. This is what's important. These are the types of questions that you're going to see. Like if you want an A, let me give you all the secrets. You definitely want to enroll in study school because I'm leaking all of them to the special girls that are inside. And right now we currently have 12 spots taken and I'm only taking 33 because I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with the girls inside of study school and so um, I have to make sure that I have the time the mental energy to dedicate to them one-on-one -on -one. so the doors for study school close on Friday at midnight so if you wanted to get in on that if you wanted to learn how to become a great student how to host effective study groups how to write papers how to study for exams and not just get advice like oh highlight your book but actually know what 
it looks like for an A student to study, then you want to at least, at least take a look at the study school website. And again, I will paste it in so that you can take a look at it. Um, let's see. Erica says, I was thinking it might be lagging on your side. There were comments and you weren't seeing them. Yeah, it was definitely lagging. That's the issue. That is the issue. Because Mickey's like, we're here, and I didn't see all of that. There was, there was definitely a delay. Any other questions, guys? Any other questions? I'm starving. I haven't eaten dinner yet. So if nobody has any other questions... I'm going to go and eat something. Going once, going twice. Let me try to refresh to make sure I'm not missing any. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And again, my name is Clarissa. I am the creator of She Rocks at College and Study School. And by the time I was a junior in college, I had failed out of seven courses and was told by my advisor that I would never make it in the medical field. I spent an entire summer researching, diving into all of the learning research that has ever been done, and I applied all of those skills to my nursing prerequisites. I ended up getting into nursing school with a 3.8 GPA, 3.8 GPA, and I graduated two years later with honors while working two jobs. So when people say that it takes forever to study, when people say that intelligence is fixed, when people say that you have to spend hours and hours and hours studying, it is not true. There are proven strategies out there, effective strategies out there that you can use to cut down on your study time and still be a top student, still get A's and B's, and all of that research is out there. Be my guest, go look for it, go apply it, but if you wanna cut down on that learning curve, if you wanna cut down on the trial and error because you don't have the money and you don't have the time to be testing out a, different, a bunch of different strategies, hoping and praying that they work, I've done the work for you. I've proven it not only with myself, but over 100 girls, college girls, over the course of two years who have seen improvements in their grades by at least one letter grade, in their self-confidence, and in their belief that they are smart enough for college. And if that's who you want to be, make sure that you check out study school. So you can go to sherocksatcollege.com forward slash study hyphen school. And I hope to see you when we start next week. Bye.